This morning, I've entitled my message, Back to Basics. I'd like to read from Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 13, and I'll be reading from the New Century Version, where it says this, We have much to say about this, but it is hard to explain because you are so slow to understand. By now you should be teachers, but you need someone to teach you again the first lessons of God's message. You still need the teaching that is like milk. You are not ready for solid food. Anyone who lives on milk is still a baby and knows nothing about right teaching. But solid food is for those who have grown up. They have practiced in order to know the difference between good and evil. The author here of Hebrews is writing to a specific audience. He's actually writing to Hebrew people. He's writing to Jewish people. And he is encouraging them to not give up on their faith. If I told you the following statistics about a certain group of people, who would you guess that I am talking about? Of this group of people, over 40% say that they are not born again. So, Becca, there's slides for this. Over 40% would say that they are not born again. 35% declare that the Bible has errors or they don't know if it has errors. 35% over one-third of this group of people claim that the Bible either has errors or they're not sure if there are errors in the Bible. Of this group of people, close to 90% attend or have attended public school. Of this same group of people, for over 45% say that Sunday school did not teach them how to defend their faith. This group says 45% of them believe that gay couples should be allowed to marry and have legal rights. 20% say that there are books other than the Bible that are inspired by God. And 65% of this group believe that if you are a good person, you will go to heaven. Now, I would say if we were to just do... Uh, ask the same question to the general population that that percentage would be even higher. But we're looking at a specific group of people. And of that specific group of people, 65% of them believe that if you're a good person, you will go to heaven. Would you be surprised to learn that this nationwide research was conducted on people in their 20s. And would it shock you even more to discover that these same people regularly, regularly attend our churches today, not once a month, not twice a month, but at least three times every month. So out of every four times that the church is open, they are in the building at least three times. They attend worship services at least three out of every four services. This um, study was actually published in um, Answers Update, which is published by a group called Answers in Genesis. And when I read those figures, it blew me away. Because these are the future of our church. 
and yet they aren't sure whether or not the Bible has mistakes in it or they think that the Bible does have errors in it. They believe that other books are inspired by God besides the Bible. And perhaps maybe most shockingly of all, that 65% of these people believe that all that's necessary to get into heaven is to just be a good person. Well, who, who sets the standard for what's good? This should, in fact, trouble all of us. Because what it really says is that we are failing our young people. We're not teaching them how to defend their faith in a world that is becoming more and more and more increasingly hostile toward Christianity. We haven't taught them about the inerrancy of God's word. We have not taught them how to live out their faith when they're outside of the church building. It should be a wake-up call for the church because it says that as the church, we are failing those who are the future of our church. This morning, I'd like to get back to the basics. And I want to cover once again some of those basic tenets that we all should know but sometimes we forget. The first is this, that all Scripture is inspired by God and is inerrant. Inerrant means that there are no mistakes. All Scripture is inspired by God and is inerrant. In 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17, it says, All Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that scripture is God-breathed. It came straight from God and it may have been penned by many, many different authors, but the message was not the individual authors. The message came directly from God. God shared his message to these people who pinned it down. In 2 Timothy 2.15, it says to study, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. What this passage says is that Scripture is reliable enough that we can study it, that we can use it for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and for training in righteousness. This is our standard. This is the rule by which God will use when every man, woman, and child stands before him in judgment. It matters not what Dan Peterson says. It doesn't matter what Billy Graham said. It doesn't matter what any of the televangelists on TV say what matters is what's in this book. This is a standard by which every single person will be judged. And if that's the case, then it's important that we know what is in here. That we can argue knowledgeably 
what the Bible has to say. We know the difference between sayings and Scripture. You know, when I say sayings, things that sometimes we attribute to Scripture but is not in fact Scripture at all. Things like uh, cleanliness is next to godliness. Well, that's not in Scripture at all. And so it's important that we know the difference between the two. And it's important that we know um, the difference between the things that are in the Old Testament and the things that are in the New Testament. Because the things that are in the Old Testament don't apply to us specifically today. In the Old Testament, when God delivered the law to the Israelite people, he said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But Jesus said to turn the other cheek, to pray for those who hurt you, to love your enemies. And unless we know what's in this book, we can't defend it. Or we don't know what the standard is by which we'll be judged. A second thing that I think is important, and the reason, the only real reason that I bring it up is because it was brought out in this study where it said there that 45% of 20-year-olds that attend church regularly believe that homosexual behavior is not sin. I want to just be clear this morning that the Bible clearly says that homosexuality is sin. Now, before you summarily label me as a bigoted homophobe, um, I want to say this. It does not matter one single bit what Dan Peterson believes. When we get to heaven, God is not going to seek my counsel. God is not going to come to me and say, how do you think I should treat these people over here? It doesn't make one single bit of difference what I believe. Again, what really matters is what is in this book. I want to say that there is a tremendous amount of pressure today for the church to be politically correct. But it doesn't matter what society thinks. What matters is what God thinks. Now, <clears throat> let me be clear in this. The Bible does teach that homosexuality is sin. The Bible also teaches that adultery is sin. The Bible teaches that gluttony is sin. The Bible teaches that lying is sin. The Bible teaches that stealing is sin. The Bible teaches that murder is sin. And we sometimes categorize sin as not so bad sins and really, really bad sins. Lying, not a bad sin. Murder, super bad sin. And then we put the rest of the sin somewhere in this scale in the middle. God doesn't really see sin that way. All sin is sin. All sin is insubordination to God. And so um, Jesus would say, before you pick the speck out of your neighbor's eye, take the log out of your own eye so that you can see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. I think it's interesting that when I was in Bible college, my professor said this. He said, if you're a chicken thief, don't be preaching about not stealing chickens. <laughs> And what I want to say is this. When we are talking about homosexuality, 
I am not focusing on people. I'm focusing on the action, the sinful action, not the person. When we talk about adultery, we're not talking about the person as much as we are talking about the sinful action that that person is doing. When we talk about gluttony, that just means that you eat past the point that you're full. Um, we're not just talking about the person. We're talking about the action of eating too much. When we talk about drunkenness, and drunkenness in the Bible doesn't just apply to um, alcohol. It applies to taking in anything to the point that you cannot function properly. I think that sometimes on Thanksgiving Day, good Christian people are guilty of drunkenness. Not because they've ingested too much alcohol, but because they've ingested too much turkey and dressing. The point here that I'm trying to make is that I want to be clear. If you wonder what the Bible has to say, the Bible says that homosexuality is sin. In Romans 1, 26 through 32, it says this, Because people did those things, God left them and let them do their, the shameful things that they wanted to do. Women stopped having natural sex and started having sex with other women. In the same way, men stopped having natural sex and began wanting each other. Men did shameful things with other men, and in their bodies they received the punishment for those wrongs. People did not think it was important to have a true knowledge of God, so God left them and allowed them to have their own worthless thinking and to do things that they should not do. They are filled with every kind of sin, evil, selfishness, and hatred. They are full of jealousy, murder, fighting, lying, and thinking the worst about other, each other. They gossip and they say evil things about each other. They hate God. They are rude. They are conceited. They brag about themselves. They invent ways of doing evil. They do not obey their parents. Man, how did that get in there? They are foolish. They do not keep their promises. They show no kindness or mercy to others. They know God's law says that those who live like this should die, but they themselves not only continue to do those evil things, they applaud others who do them. Did you notice in that list were things that we would consider to be really bad, horrible things, and there are things in there that we would say, what? Because sin is sin. We're the ones who categorize sin, not God. I want to just make one last comment regarding this, and then I'm just going to move on. And that is in regard to this whole push for churches to become politically correct. I want to remind you that Christianity is 2,000 years old, about. Christianity has existed for approximately 2,000 years, and this nation has not yet seen its 300th birthday. Nations have risen and nations have fallen. And what has been in this book has remained. Just because people say that something is so does not make it true. And it doesn't matter how many people say that it is so. It doesn't change the truth. Do you remember the, the children's book, The Emperor's New Clothes? And in that children's book, the tailors, they uh, sew up these imaginary clothes. 
and they uh, dress the emperor in these imaginary clothes and the, the emperor decides that he's going to uh, go on a parade and he goes through the kingdom and everybody pretends or thinks that the emperor is wearing these amazing clothes and if I can remember correctly it is a child that says you're in your underwear everybody was willing to play along with the imaginary finery the imaginary clothing that the emperor was wearing, but the reality was he was standing there in front of everybody in his underwear. I think today that there's a lot of that exact same thing going on in regard to political correctness. That doesn't mean that we should treat people that don't, we don't agree with differently. Do you remember Jesus with the woman at the well? Or Jesus with the woman caught in adultery? They bring this woman to Jesus who was supposedly caught in the very act of adultery. And they want Jesus to give them permission to take her out and stone her. And the Bible says that Jesus began writing in the dirt, and we have no idea what he wrote. The Bible doesn't tell us. I've often wondered if Jesus began to write the sins of the people that were accusing this woman. And the Bible says that all of the accusers went away from the oldest to the youngest. And Jesus looked up, and seeing that no one was there but this woman, he said, Woman, where are your accusers? And she said, they're gone. And I find Jesus' response to be very interesting. He says, neither do I accuse you. Go and sin no more. Jesus didn't say, well, that's okay. You know, we all just do different things. Jesus didn't, didn't condone her behavior. But he encouraged her to do better. Jesus loves all people regardless of who they are and what they have done. His love is not based off of your actions. His love for you is based solely on the fact that you are. But God has given you a free will and he will allow you to choose where you spend eternity even if that means that you choose to be apart from him. The third thing that I'd like to mention this morning <clears throat> is this, that just being good won't get you into heaven. Just being good won't get you into heaven. In Romans 3, 22 through 25, it says this, God makes people right with himself through their faith in Jesus Christ. This is true for all who believe in Christ because all people are the same. All have sinned and are not good enough for God's glory. And all need to be made right with God by his grace, which is a free gift. They need to be free made free from sin through Jesus Christ. God gave him as a way to forgive sin through faith in the blood of Jesus' death. This showed that God always does what is right and fair. And then Romans 6, 23, where it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Those two verses tell us that every single one of us, every single person who has walked this planet, save Jesus alone, has sinned. And that the wages of that sin is death. But that the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. You see, 
there's only two options here. Somebody has to pay the price for our sin. Do you remember the movie National Treasure with um, Nicholas, Nicholas Cage, I believe it was? Um, and at the very end of the movie, they found the treasure. They're back up in the church building. They're sitting up here on the stage, not my stage, but, you know, the stage there in the church. And the guy who's from the CIA or the FBI or one of those alphabet agencies says to him, he says, what do you want? And he turns to the officer and he says, what I really, really really want is to not go to jail. And do you remember what he says? He says, somebody has got to go to jail. Somebody has to go to jail. You can't just steal the Declaration of Independence and nobody go to jail. Somebody has to go to jail. Well, that was just a movie. But in real life, somebody has to pay the price for our sin. That will either be Jesus or that will be you. The wages of that sin is death. Jesus died on the cross of Calvary not for anything that he did. He died for the sins of the world. But if you don't want to accept that gift, then you'll pay the price for your own sins. And you'll die an eternal death where you'll spend the rest of eternity separated from God. It's just that simple. You see, it doesn't matter how good you are. It only takes one sin to separate you from God. Only one. And the Bible says that all of us, every single one of us has sinned. God's not going to uh, have us stand before him and weigh our good deeds on one side and our bad deeds on the other. And as long as we were more good than more bad, that he'll let us into heaven. Do you remember um, Lilo and Stitch, the very first one? I don't know if there was even a second one. But um, the little girl, Uh, Lilo draws this picture of Stitch and you know Stitch is glitching out and he does bad things because he's you know got problems right and she colors in his badness level and then the next bad thing he does she colors in higher and higher and higher until you know the badness level is all the way to the top of the picture of Stitch and sometimes I think that that's how God is going to approach judgment. That if we're more bad than good, then we won't get to go to heaven. But if we're more good than bad, then he's going to let us in. Or that somehow, eventually, all of us will make it. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Not even close. The Bible says that narrow is the way. That leads to um, heaven and few there be that find it. But broad is the way that leads to destruction. The fourth and the final thing that I'd like to mention this morning is this. That in order to be saved, you must be born again. In order to be saved, you must be born again. In John 3, 3 through 8, Jesus said... In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he was born of water and of the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Jesus said, if you want to go to heaven, 
You've got to be born again. It's the bottom line. Not everybody is going to make it. You can't be good enough on your own. You can't get there off of somebody else's good deeds. There's a person that my wife works with. And she has said on more than one occasion, when we get to judgment, I want you to be with me, beside me, and hold my hand. And my wife has said, there's nothing that I can do for you. I'm going to be on my own, and I'm going to need Jesus just as much as you are. You see, God loves you. God loves you because you are, not because of how what you have done. He doesn't love you any less because of the things, the bad things that you have done. God loves you whether you are, you know, a, a priest, a minister, an atheist, an agnostic, whether you have problems with lying, whether you have problems with stealing, whether you have problems with adultery, whether you struggle with homosexuality, whether you struggle with, you know, any number of sins, God loves you. And he wants to spend the rest of eternity with you. But you must Accept the gift that Jesus offers. You must be born again. You have to hear the word of Jesus. You have to hear about salvation. You have to believe. Not just mentally assent to it, but, but actually accept it and believe it and change the way that you act. You have to repent, which is a military term. That means about face. If I'm going in this direction and sinning, I turn the direction and I no longer do those same sins that I did in the past. And that doesn't mean that I'll never slip up or that I'll never struggle or that I'll never fail. But that as I look at my life, I see decreasence, uh, decreasing frequency of sin, that I sin, I struggle less with the things that I used to struggle with as time continues to go by. That I confess Jesus. Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father who is in heaven. And then we need to be baptized. You know, Jesus died, he was buried, and he was raised to life on the third day. When we are baptized... If you are immersed, you symbolize that same death, that same burial under the water, and that same resurrection as a new creature in Christ. Do, does it matter um, that maybe I don't like water, or does it matter that I think God should do it another way? Nope doesn't make any difference at all because it's God's way not ours if you want the gift you have to accept it God's way and we give you that opportunity now nobody's going to be walking down the aisle this morning there's nobody in the church except for me and Becca but if you have a decision that you need to make then we encourage you we we implore you we plead with you to get together with someone who can lead you to Jesus or to get a hold of me and somehow we'll get you the gospel message. We'll answer your questions. We'll help you with your struggle. But please understand that eternity is forever. And the decisions that you make while you are breathing and living in this world will determine where you spend the rest of forever. Won't you accept Jesus? Jesus.